So because this is a talk on depleting the weed seed bank, I am going to talk primarily about my work with Harvest Weed Seed Control. Um, before I jump into it, I wanted to thank the, maybe, there we go. Thank the funders of all the Harvest Weed Seed Control work that's been done to date, including Alberta Canola, Western Grains, Saskatchewan Wheat Development Commission, Alberta Wheat Commission, ACIDEF, NSERC, and Ag Canada. Uh, I also have to send a huge thank you out to the technicians that I work with, as well as all the summer students and co-op students that work with us uh, during the growing seasons. Without them, I would be standing up here looking very awkward with nothing to talk about. Um, and so I really appreciate all the work that they do on behalf of our program. So depleting the weed seed bank, this has become uh, a focus in the last number of years. And Australia is kind of leading the the, the push in this area with their work on harvest weed seed control. So what is it? It's a new paradigm of weed control targeting a new or a different life cycle stage of the weeds that's been developed and refined in Australia. The goal is to manage the weed seeds that are still in the field at the time of harvest and prevent their dispersal. So the biggest weed seeder in the world is your combine. When you go through a patch of weeds at the time of harvest, a lot of those weed seeds are going to come out the back of the combine in the chaff and your spreaders do a fantastic job of broadcast seeding them across your field to be next year's problem. So the goal is to try and prevent those seed, seed bank inputs from happening. Now, in order for harvest weed seed control to be effective, there's sort of three main criteria that have to be met. One, the weed seeds have to be retained at the time of harvest. If those weed seeds are already on the ground, they're already in your seed bank, they're gone. You can't suck them up. I'm trying to figure out how you could incorporate a vacuum system, but we're not there yet. So they have to still be there at the time of crop harvest. They have to be produced at a height where they will be collected by the combine. So things that are really prostrate, think chickweed, really low to the ground, we typically don't cut that low. And if you're not cutting that low, they're not going into the combine. Again, you can't target them. The third one is you have to be able to collect the weed with the combine. And, and this sounds like a bit of a strange um, criteria to add here. But in this picture, there's two tumbleweeds. They're a little hard to see. Uh, but they're these great big tumble mustards. This was from a field when I was helping with some research in Australia. And the seed was retained at the time of harvest. That's great. They're clearly nice and tall in the canopy. Shouldn't be an issue. They were about my height. Um, but when we took the combine through, they were tumbleweeds. They rolled up the top of the header and off the sides and didn't actually go into the combine. So that's where this comes from. There's not a lot of weeds where this would be an issue, but it is worth mentioning. Now, there's a lot of different methods of harvest weed seed control. I'm going to talk about the ones that are generally recognized as sort of the official harvest weed seed control methods. But I had a conversation with a producer actually on Twitter last week. Um, and he said, well, I, I, don't, I don't harvest my kochia. I leave it stand, and then I go and bale it afterwards. And I said, well, that's essentially the same idea. You're still preventing those seed bank inputs by doing something at the time of harvest generally. So I'm going to go through the main ones. but. There are other ways of doing this as well. So the first one that really caught on in Australia was called narrow windrow burning. So both the straw and the chaff were dropped behind the combine. It was fairly cheap and easy to implement. These chutes were designed by producers primarily. They were welding them themselves. But there were some environmental impacts because these rows are behind every pass of the combine. And then what they were doing is they were going out and they were lighting them on fire. And it worked really well. Fire is a great weed killer but it's also burning all of your residue. And it's slightly terrifying to think of a whole bunch of these swaths burning across the prairies in the fall at the time of harvest when we are, maybe not this year, but most years, quite dry. So slightly concerning, there was at one point about 60% of producers in Western Australia using this method. It's now tapered off in favor of some of the other methods that you're going to see. Chaff carts. Chaff carts were originally developed in Canada. The Redicop chaff carts made in Saskatchewan. Um, Australians have essentially modified them. We used to use a blower system that would blow the chaff into the cart. They're now using the conveyor systems that you see on the ones on the screen. And it, it's less prone to some blockages and, and more efficient transfer and things like that. Now you do still need to do something with those piles. So if you have livestock, great, you might be able to graze those piles. Uh, but otherwise, again, you're going to need to burn them or something like that. that. Now, some of these chaff carts are, are getting fairly fancy. Um, the one on the right-hand side of your screen is actually set up with uh, GPS so that you can program before you go into the field where you want the chaff cart to dump 
in your field, so if there's an area that's easier for you to fence off or something like that, you can program it so that it all does it automatically as you're driving up and down the field. Bit of a pain in the butt because you have to tow something, but they have been used quite effectively and actually quite a lot in Australia especially. The bale direct system, this is essentially a baler hooked onto your combine to bale the chaff and the straw. Um, one of the negatives with this one is you do lose the residue from the field. So you're baling it and you're taking it off the field. You're not getting those residue benefits of leaving it to decompose. And there's also potential for transport of weed seeds. So as much as I like you guys, I really don't want you selling your bales to central Alberta where we don't have a kosher problem yet because that could move in those bales to our area, right? Things like that. Um, not a ton of adoption in Australia with this one because it was a fairly limited market for the bales. Uh, but again, if you have a mixed farming operation, this might be a good fit. Chaff tramlining. Chaff tramlining is intended to be used in a controlled traffic farming system. So we are going to see more of it in Australia than we do here because we don't have as much controlled traffic farming. But the idea is that those permanent tram lines, where you're only traveling on those tram lines, that's where you're going to put the chaff down. The weed seeds are in the chaff. You're going to drive over them a bunch of times during the season, plus it's already the least productive part of your field. You could also, potentially, do a very targeted spray just on your tram lines, if that's where most of your weed seeds are. So you don't have to do the entire field. Now, there's an idea that we may be getting some decomposition of the weed seeds in the chaff line, sort of a composting effect. Um, that's anecdotal as far as I understand from the producers, and I don't think we've actually been able to show that happening yet in the research. Um, but we have certainly shown less emergence or less germination if there's heavy enough chaff uh, in those lines. Now, sort of sister to this is chaff lining. This would be used if you're not on a controlled traffic farming system, where the chaff is placed into a single row behind the combine. So instead of putting it on those wheel tracks, you're just going to put it all down in a single row. Now, again, the idea is that you're limiting the area of your field where those weeds would compete with the crop. So it's not competing across your entire field, it's just in these very narrow strips that hopefully you can do some targeted management of those strips uh, instead of having to manage the entire field. Again, potential decomposition happening, maybe some composting. Potential seeding or emergence issues. It's not something that anyone in Australia has really been talking about, at least um, on Twitter, where I can kind of pick their brains. Um, they don't really care, is my impression, because they're managing their ryegrass. Ryegrass is a big enough pest for them that if it affects their germination a little bit, that's fine because at least they're managing their ryegrass. So that is a concern. I'm hoping to look at this in Western Canada. We're waiting to hear if we get funding or not. Um, and if we do, we'll be looking for partners. So if anyone's really interested in this, come see me. Physical impact mills. So physical impact mills is the one that we've done the most work on in Western Canada. Um, the original Harrington Seed Destructor, which if you look at the background of the slides, you can see the giant beast up in the top right hand corner. That is the original Harrington Seed Destructor, the big bulky tow behind machine. That is no longer available. They don't make that one anymore. What you see on your screen is the replacement. It's the IHSD, the Integrated Harrington Seed Destructor, and it does essentially the same thing. It's the same mills, does the same thing, it impacts those seeds, it breaks them apart to kill them, but it's now built into the back of the combine. So that's the integrated Harrington seed destructor. The HSD, the original, was the first one on the market. It was big news. Now it has competitors. So this is the Redicop SCU, the seed control unit. Redicop is based out of Saskatoon. They just launched this unit in this last year. Um, they are marketing primarily in Australia right now, but are planning to market here in North America in the next little while. But they are direct competition to the IHSD. It's the first real harvest weed seed control uh, piece of equipment that is happening from North America instead of Australia. Both of these units use a cage mill system or a modified cage mill system. Um, the third version is the seed terminator. It uses a slightly different type of mill. It's a multi-stage hammer mill, but it's the same idea. It's going to break up and kill those weed seeds. Uh, seed terminator is another Australian based company. Um, the IHSD and the Seed Terminator, Seed Terminator says it nicely, they say they're colorblind, which means they'll work on any brand of combine. Uh, the Redicop version right now is only for John Deere, but they do plan to branch out. And the Redicop version is paired with their MAV chopper, is my understanding. 
So there's now three physical impact mills. That's been since when I started my PhD in 2014, there was one and it was the original tow behind. So in less than five years, we're up to three competitors on the market. There's also one more for sure in development in Australia, and I've also heard rumors of another one in Europe. I haven't gotten confirmation of that yet. So we're looking at potentially five different mills in the time span of about five years. Now, which method is best? All that have been tested have shown high efficacy on the weeds. So for the mills, there's been greater than 90% control of weed seeds in the samples. We're looking at about 60 to 70% control in a good year in the field. That's variable, of course, because as with everything in farming, it varies with the weather. Um, but you're not going to get every weed seed that's in the field. You're going to have some that drop off. You're going to have some that you didn't pick up because they were too low, those types of things. So we, we aren't looking at that 90% control of the population. Some of these methods have not yet been scientifically tested. Producers are adopting them and using them, but we actually haven't done the research on them yet. Every method has its pros and cons, so really the best method is whatever happens to work in your system that also is effective on the weeds. In Western Canada, we've done, like I said, the most research on the physical impact implements because you get to leave the residue on your field. If you're not a mixed producer, you don't have to deal with those residues, and it seems to be fairly effective. I just wanted to talk a little bit about adoption of harvest weed seed control in Australia. Uh, there were 600 growers that were surveyed in 2016 looking at the adoption of narrow windrow burning, chaff carts, chaff tram lining, bale direct, and the HSD, because this is before those, all those competitors in the integrated mills came out. 43% of Australian producers were using harvest weed seed control, and that's where narrow windrow burning was really being used quite a lot. Um, this year, there was an online survey of 147 farmers. It is biased because it's online, so it's who's following them, but it does show some interesting trends. The percent of growers not using harvest weed seed control was 60% in 2014, and it's expected to be 5% in 2022. That is a huge shift in terms of producers adopting this technology. The top user this harvest was chaff lining or tram lining. Again, it's a slightly smaller price tag than some of the physical impact mills. Uh, and I'll come back to the cost in just a minute. By 2022, most of those producers are intending to be using the impact mills. They believe the price will come down, and they are just um, more research into them. They're, they're shown to be a little bit more effective. Narrow windrow burning, which was about 45% in 2016, is expected to be minimal by 2022 because of the risks associated with fire and some of those environmental impacts. Now, the biggest thing that I hear talking about this is the mills are too expensive. And it isn't a small amount to change. It's eighty-five dollars to $100,000 for one of the physical impact mills. So that is a large chunk of change. But Josh Laid is a farmer who farms just north of Saskatoon. He runs two seed terminators on his farm. And so he, him and I actually were able to just give a talk last week at Farm Forum. And he had some nice math worked out. So I asked him if I could steal this from him. So for his seed terminator, it was about $98,000 Australian dollars plus uh, an adaption kit of fifteen dollars to $20,000. He farms a 4,000 acre farm. So he figured it out to be a $33,000 financed over four years uh, with 5% interest. He uses about a dollar per acre for fuel. That's what he, he accounts for. He also has a budget of $5,000 for repairs and maintenance. He said he has yet to use that in the two years that he's run the seed terminators, but that's what he has set aside just in case. That comes out to $42,000 per year, which works out for him to $10.50 an acre. If you think about what you're spending on your herbicides and how much your herbicide costs are going to go up to manage resistant weeds, those types of things, this $10.50 an acre doesn't sound nearly so unreasonable as $100,000. If you break it down by acre, and if you're doing more than 4,000 acres, that number is going to drop. In the last herbicide resistance survey in Alberta, Alberta producers were estimating that resistant weeds were costing them $17 an acre. So how does this not make sense? Again, the economics are going to be different on every farm, but it's, it's something to think about how this could break down for your farm. This is the effect of harvest weed seed control in Australia. They have what they call focus paddocks, so they've been going back to them and doing weed counts in these same fields each year. Um, and you can see the decline in the ryegrass numbers in these fields, particularly with harvest weed seed control. 
The other thing that I wanted to just show you, we're, you know, we, we talk about this especially for resistant weeds, but what about volunteers? Volunteer canola, volunteer cereals, those can be an issue. And even if they're only growing in the fall, they are sucking up moisture. In drought years, that moisture could be really valuable to leave in your reserves. So this is a picture, again, from Josh Lade. This was this fall on his farm. So on the right-hand side, those orange strips, that's where his combine that had the seed terminator on it went. On the left-hand side, you can see the plus. That matches up with his field. This is an NDVI image of his field, which means the greener it is, the more things that are growing there. So in the fall after harvest, you don't necessarily want there to be things growing there because, again, they're taking up moisture. You can see the impact that he had on the volunteers in that field. That's kind of cool to see. Now, I wanted to talk about what weeds we can target with these uh, machines. This is a slide from Hugh Becky, who's coming up next, that I stole from him. This is the top 10 weeds in Saskatchewan. A lot of them cross over to Alberta. And it's just more so the point that I wanted to get across is looking at seed retention. So within these weeds, anything that is in blue, the seed retention has been me measured in small plot or producer fields. Everything in, back in black is expert opinion, and when Hugh is the expert, I trust it. Um, so you can see we do have a number of pores in terms of seed retention, dandelion, narrow-leaf hawksbeards, all the ones that have the white fluffy material that blow in the wind, yeah, they don't retain their seeds real well. The other pore that's a concern would be wild oat, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Some good targets though, lamb's quarters, cleavers, volunteer canola, green foxtail, those are some good weeds to be able to target. Just to give you a picture of how we do this in terms of seed retention, basically we have shatter trays out where we're collecting the seeds over time. So you get these nice curves. You can see um, the one on the left, that's for my PhD with wild oat along the bottom. And I also wanted to talk quickly about kochia. Kochia we need to do a little bit more work on. Um, the seeds only mature after harvest, so there's high levels of retention, which is good. But over 5,000 seeds can be retained below the cutting height at harvest. Now that's on, obviously, the plant on the left, which is big and bushy and probably didn't have a lot of crop competition. But we need to figure out how many of those seeds would be there on the plant on the right. And so how much of an effect we would have on the population. But still, 5,000 seeds going into the seed bank is a lot better than 50,000 seeds going into the seed bank. So perspective is also needed here. So we did do some stationary threshing with the seed destructor, and I'm going to go through these graphs fairly quickly. Um, we looked at five different factors, weed seed species, kochia, green, fox green foxtail, cleavers, volunteer canola, and wild oat. We looked at weed seed size, where we kept the same weed, we kept volunteer canola, but we sieved it so that we had really small canola seeds up to the bigger canola seeds, just to see how the seed destructor or these cage mills would actually work on them. Weed seed number between 10 and a million canola seeds in a five gallon pail of chaff. Chaff volume, uh, no chaff to eight five gallon pails with the same number of wheat seeds in them, as well as chaff type. So how we did this, this is our John Deere 6620 plot combine in Lacombe. Normally the chaff goes from a tube from the blower into the spreaders. We took the tube off and tied our very fancy mini bulk bag on the back and dragged it behind and filled the mini bulk bag. We did at one point have a hammer tied on the back so that it weighed it down and didn't come up into the spreaders. We're very high tech sometimes in our research. That chaff went into five gallon pails. We mixed it with our volunteer canola seeds. Those went up to the top of the seed destructor and they were dumped in. We took about 30 seconds to dump those pails into the seed destructor, let the machine run for another 30 seconds so that it was all cleared out. Then we went to the back and we collected those samples. Those samples came with us back to Lacombe. We cleaned them and we germinated what was left and what was viable. Just for a visual, these are the chaffs before and after going through the seed destructor. On the left is your before, on the right is after. So you can see it's a much finer material, much finer residue, and a much smaller volume because it's so fine. If we look at the results, this is by species. Basically what you can see is yes, cleavers were not controlled as well as wild oat were, but what I wanted you to focus on is actually on this side. Our range was between 97.5 and, and 99.8% control of what was going through the mills. Uh, so statistically, yes, there was a difference by species in the field. Eh, it's going to work pretty darn good. Canola seed size, same type of story. The line angles up, which means as the seeds get bigger, we got more control. We were within a percentage point of 98.5% control. Again, statistically, yes, biologically, it works pretty good. Weed seed number. 
This one's a little bit different. As we get to 100 seeds in our sample, we were back up at that 98% control range. With 10 seeds, it was lower, it was about 84% control, but that's probably a factor of there just weren't enough seeds to actually give us a good measure. Um, that was a sample size issue more than anything. Chaff volume, again, as chaff volume increased, we got better control and then it kind of uh, tapered off, maybe some cushioning by the chaff, but again, if you look at the range, 98 to just over 99% control, it worked pretty good. Chaff type, canola, less control, but again, 98 to 98 and a half percent control. Plus, we were using volunteer canola seed in canola chaff, which probably had its own population of volunteer canola, which I didn't account for in the math. So that may have skewed that a little bit. So basically, if you can get it in the seed destructor, greater than 95% of it will die. The trick is getting it in the comma. So it's really fulfilling to dump seeds in and knowing you are destroying them as a weed scientist, but it's also really dirty and really itchy. This was after about two hours of running samples and we ran samples for four days. So it was a, a very long week and a very itchy week of running samples. Now, how does it work in the field? We don't know yet. This picture that's on the screen is taken from one of my producer fields in the Lacombe area. We have 20 producer fields where we have run the seed destructor for three harvests, right beside areas in the field that are untreated. And it's replicated three times in each of those producer fields. So we're working on it, but we don't know yet. We did learn some lessons though. Green or wet material, not good. It doesn't mill well. Just like it doesn't like going through your combine and being threshed, it doesn't like being ground up. It doesn't flow. Um, Josh, again, Josh Lade from Saskatoon says, if you have green material, you can run up to 25% of that green material through, but you need 75% of the material going through to be dry. Otherwise, you end up with these situations where it's plugged and everyone's unhappy while you unplug it. If you've got a large green patch, leave it like you would a slew. Come back to it at the end of harvest when it's had some time to dry down or your desiccant has had time to take effect or whatever you need to do. Just leave it, come back to it later. After one year of results with our seed destructor, I haven't gotten to the two years yet. Um, basically, we didn't have any significant differences as of yet. We had weed numbers that were down, but there was no differences really between our check and our seed destructor yet. We didn't expect there to be after one year. There's a seed bank, right? So your, your impact on the weed populations isn't going to be immediate because you still have that seed bank in the soil, which is going to supply population for a couple of years. I haven't yet looked at after two years because this is what our data sheets look like. Um, it takes a while to get the data entered and then it takes a while for me to actually analyze it. So we're working on it, but we're not there yet. I, I asked my tech, you know, any chance we'll get that soon? And she said, come back later. I said, okay, good talk. Being the first one to test new equipment, it can be frustrating. Whether you're a researcher, whether you're an early adopter farmer, it can be frustrating because you're the one working out the bugs. Our first year with the seed destructor, I called Australia three times and I'm surprised the government didn't take my phone away. But they let me. But you also get to see the benefits first. You also get to be the one that starts looking at your weed populations and our four or five years in, in front of other guys that maybe haven't looked at this yet. Like I said, this is a three year study. So we've done our three harvests. We're trying to allow for some of that seed bank buffering to take place. We'll be doing final weed counts and weed seed bank sampling this coming spring. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to see an effect in those three years. It's not, not a cheap project because of all the logistics of moving a combine and a seed destructor and people and everything else. Harvest weed seed control is getting more popular each year in Australia. I know for sure there's ongoing research in the US, particularly in the southern US, and they are starting to see people adopting things like narrow windrow burning and, and seriously looking at some of these integrated mill options, as well as research being done in Europe, particularly in the UK. Now, I, I did talk to producers a couple years ago and actually asked them for, what are your experiences? I've, I've talked to the researchers, I've worked with the researchers, but as producers, what can you tell me? Narrow windrow burning, they were dealing with fertility differences, especially with K. But a benefit of narrow windrow burning was that it also managed sclerotinia inoculum. They found a reduction in sclerotinia incidence on fields that had had narrow windrow burning. Chaff deck, chaff lining, at the time it was great systems, they needed some technology. Um, for chaff tram lining, there is the chaff deck, which is actually being sold by Redicop out of Saskatoon, so there is technology available for CTF, CTF growers. Uh, one of the things they were watching for was population shifts. So this is still a selection pressure. This is not a silver bullet. 
it is still a selection pressure. And just like weeds develop resistance to herbicides, they do find ways to develop resistance to these kinds of strategies. So in this case, what they were finding was that after about 10 years of harvest weed seed control, in one field they were seeing their ryegrass was laying more prostrate on the ground instead of standing upright like it normally did. We do select for changes in our weed populations. These are new strategies, there's bugs to work out, but these types of shifts are why it's important to look at adopting it while your herbicides still work because then you've got multiple selection pressures instead of one big one and you're more likely to have all of them be effective for a longer term of time. Harvest weed seed control use in Canada, there are two seed terminators running in Saskatchewan, both on Josh Lade's farm. A Canadian company is produ producing an impact mill, even though it's currently only sold in Australia, it will be marketed here shortly. Money still seems to be the big holdback, but again, $10.50 per acre on 4,000 acres. It doesn't seem so unreasonable when you look at a per acre price. The other thing is you don't need to outfit every machine in your operation. Even if you only put it on one machine, if you put an impact mill on one machine, that machine does your weedy patches, maybe it does your headlands where you've got more weeds or your areas where you have concerns about the weeds. You strategically put it into the places where you need that extra control. If you've got a patch, use it for patch management. Don't keep that patch, don't allow that patch to keep spreading, things like that. When you look at the increase in resistant weeds, you know, we're hearing more about glyphosate resistance, three-way resistant kochia, things like that. How long can we hold out against trying some of these new strategies? I'm pretty available online. My Twitter handle is up there. My email is up there. If you don't want to ask questions here, that's fine. Reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about this because someone's interested in my research. So if you want to talk, feel free to reach out. Thanks very much, Brianne. Wow. Not only are you doing great work, you give a great presentation. Really enjoyed that. <laughs> lots of enthusiasm, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, so don't let me monopolize this. Grab, grab a microphone. Now, here's a question you may not have heard before, believe it or not, and there'll be producers in the crowd that will maybe shoot down this theory. <laughs> but why aren't we trying to just collect the weed seeds in the hopper of the combine? You know, I'm, I'm a grower of, of sometimes intercrops, chickpeas and flax. And yep. people say, oh, how can, you, how can you harvest them together? Well, you, you turn the fan way down so you don't blow the flax out the back end. Yep. And you, you end up with a lot dirtier sample. Yep. But is that a way to be handling this? And if you had to, then maybe you need to clean that grain to get it fit for market. If the weed seed count is fairly low, perhaps it can still be sold commercially without cleaning it. Has anybody looked at that method of, of weed seed? Collection. So recently I'm going to say no, but there was actually the McLeod harvesters did exactly that, right? You, you harvested everything, you kept everything, and then you separated it afterwards. So I think, I think the hold back to doing something like that is unfamiliarity with it, the need to manage it afterwards. The cleaning, you need to have the equipment, you need to have, it's, it's more management afterwards. So I think that would be the hold back or yeah, the They didn't the have any, any sieving at all in the, in the McLeod Yes. System though, yeah. they were bringing the you know it was really rough material yeah. with all of the that'd all of the, the chaff extreme. and everything. Yeah, that'd be the extreme. Yeah, but yeah, so I, I don't know that there's been any research done on that, but th there's no reason it couldn't be an option as long as you're preventing those weed seeds from going back to the seed bank. It's, that's it's a, good a win. Thing. It's a win. It's a win. Yeah. Yeah. Questions for Brienne? Come on, you guys, don't don't let me down like this. <laughs> no questions. So you, you were saying that Redicop is marketing just into Australia now, is that, that, at least, is that right? That was my understanding of their initial plan anyways, okay. was to market in in Australia because there was a market for it there, yeah. um, and then begin marketing it here within the next year. So they were open, um, if you go to, what is their website? HarvestWeedSeedControl.com. I don't know how they managed to steal that mm -hmm. domain name, but they did. Um, there's a form there where you can put in an expression of interest already for all of their stuff, so. Cool. Yeah. There we go, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you think we can collect it or is it constructed or what's your So we went down to Kosha was the smallest one that I tested. Um, and part of that is because you have to be able to find it afterwards to do the germination. So the, doing the research on some of those really small seeded ones is difficult. Everything I've seen in my research in the US, everywhere, is if you can get it in, it seems to be effective. 
Um, but I, I would have to actually do some research on that to see. I'm trying to think if we have pigweeds in any of our producer fields. We seem to have everything else. But I can't pull to mind if we have pigweeds or not. I'll get back to you, Bill. Why, why is it tougher in an irrigated field with red, is red root pigweed? Or is it a different type of pigweed? Yeah, no, possibly as well, yeah. There's nothing I've seen in the research that would suggest it wouldn't work at this point. I'm not guaranteeing anything, though. You can't hold me to it. But kosher would be a prime target just because of the, the multiple resistance that's, yeah. that's showing up that yeah. makes anything. And also, I would think that uh, since kosher is fairly short-lived in the, in the seed bank, two or three years longevity, that it would be a great target because if you could eliminate it or reduce it for two or three years, you make a big difference in the seed bank. Yeah, right? I, I don't see how kosher would not be a good fit for some of these technologies. It seems like it would be a really good target for the harvest weed seed control idea. Here, let, let me grab you the mic so everybody can hear. What I was wondering was, you still have a seed in the soil bank, or a seed bank in the soil. Yep. Any, any information yet as to how that's impacted over your two, three year, two or three years of, stu of study? So we're going to take soil seed bank cores this coming spring. Um, we talked about doing it this fall, but then this fall is what this fall was. And so that got pushed to this spring. So we will actually be growing out those seed bank samples to see how we're impacting the seed bank. Um, the results from Australia, at least with ryegrass, are showing that they've driven those seed banks down fairly quickly with harvest weed seed control. Each weed is going to be different because of like wild mustard may not be as effective because of how long lived it is in the soil. Kosha, two to three years, okay, we might have a good target there. So there are going to be some differences for sure by species, but we, yeah, this spring we'll be doing a, a lot of soil seed bank sampling. My technicians are not all that thrilled with me. Is there someone over here? Any other questions? Okay, so the question is, when they were doing the narrow windrow burning, were they burning the entire field? No. They were able to concentrate the residue enough, and they do have lower yielding crops too, which does play into that a little bit. But they were able to just burn the individual rows. They, they waited for very specific conditions so that they didn't have a 40 degree day with the wind blowing the wrong way where it did take off across the field. Um, but they had very specific conditions they were watching for where you would get a slow, sustained, hot burn. Um, yeah, but they, they were very effective at burning just, just those rows and leaving the straw. Or the stubble, I should say. Make for quite some aerial photographs, wouldn't it? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in uh, thanking Brianne for a great presentation. Thank you.